2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things, and now you know what is holding him back, so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you, in every good deed and word. Okay, well, if you want to keep that passage open in front of you, uh, we'll be working our way through that this afternoon. Uh, Now, I don't know if you realise, but if you go and talk to people in our community here in Mackay, there's actually a whole lot of different viewpoints about what is coming uh, in the future. Uh, about a month or so ago, I was uh, kind of knocking on people's doors, trying to chat to them about Jesus. Uh, and, and I was having this conversation. I generally ask people the question, uh, what do you think is, is coming in the future for our world? What's your opinion? Uh, and on this particular day, I got all these different answers to that question. The first person, uh, she thought that what this world was headed for uh, was a utopian paradise. She believed in karma. Uh, that principle that if you do good, then you will get good, and so uh, if you do bad, you get bad. She believed that through the principle of karma, we would eventually learn the lessons and end up in this utopian paradise. That was her belief about the future. Uh, some of the other, the next people I talked to, they were not so positive. They were kind of looking at the American political scene and kind of things going on around the world, the general rottenness of humans around them, and they thought, no, things are probably going to get worse. Uh, Another lady that I chatted to was very negative, not a Christian, but she said that uh, what she thought was coming in the future uh, was going to end in apocalypse. Uh, There was going to be judgment. I'd actually asked this lady previously, what's your view of God? And she said, he's sometimes good, but he's sometimes cruel. Uh, And I said to her, you've had a tough life, haven't you? And she said, yes, yes, I have. Uh, That was her opinion. It was going to be bad in the future. Uh, A bunch of other people that I talked to, they they, they had no idea. They weren't thinking about it. They were just living life. Uh, not really concerned about what was coming in the future. And so there's all these different views around us in the community. Uh, And of course, for those of you who are Christians here this afternoon, you'll no doubt know that Christians themselves uh, can take different views about these things. Uh, For some Christians, uh, they're actively seeking to live kind of gospel-centered lives with the expectation and hope that as they do that in their community, that there will actually be transformation in that community, that there will actually be forward progress Uh, in the midst of that community. Um, There's a very positive view about what the future will hold. Uh, There are others who are very negative. They're just kind of looking for the signs that we are headed towards the end and the judgment day. Uh, There are some who think that that day of judgment is coming sooner, uh, others who think it's coming later. Uh, And then there's a bunch of people who just think it'll pan out in the end. They don't think too much about it. In fact, they try and think as little as possible about what is coming at the end. 
And of course, what you think about the future, it, it does matter. Because what you think is coming will affect how you act and behave here and now. And so I want to ask the question this afternoon, what do, what do we kind of make of that? How do we know what will happen in the future? And maybe more to the point, how do we deal with all these competing opinions that we're surrounded by about what the future actually holds? Uh, well, let's pray as we come to think about that together from God's Word. Let's pray. Uh, loving Father, we, we thank you that you speak. Uh, we thank you that as we think about where this world is headed, that you have not left us in the dark. Uh, you have given us the light of your word. And Father, we pray that that light would shine brightly uh, this afternoon as you uh, work in our midst by your spirit. Give me words to speak that are from you. Uh, and we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, last week we began this series through 2 Thessalonians, and as we open it up this week, we'll, we'll get to see pretty quickly that really nothing's changed too much, uh, just as there is this diversity of opinion about the future now, um, well, so it was the same back in Paul's day. And in fact, even in the first letter, uh, we're reading 2 Thessalonians, but Paul had written a previous letter to this church in Thessalonica, even back then there were issues relating to the end that this church was having. Um, they'd become Christians, they'd started seeing their brothers and sisters in Christ dying, um, and they were concerned about that. They obviously had this expectation that Jesus was going to return uh, before people started dying, and Paul had to assure them in 1 Thessalonians, no, it's okay, uh, if you die, you'll be gathered up to Jesus when he returns, and if you're still alive, you'll go to be with Jesus, you don't need to be concerned. He urged them not to be worried about times and dates, but just live for the Lord now, and, and trust that God will work things out when Jesus comes back. But of course, by the time Paul is writing this second letter, maybe not too long afterwards, it would seem that the Thessalonians have uh, been taught uh, this second wrong message uh, about the return of Jesus and what's going to happen at the end. Uh, they'd really been t told that Jesus was coming back immediately. If you have a look at what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1 there. He says, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily alarmed or unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. And Paul, in these verses, he uses three different terms uh, to talk about the, the coming of Jesus, the, the end times. Uh, he says on that day, verse 1, that Jesus will come, he will return. The second thing he talks about, uh, assuming a Christian audience, he says, uh, speaks of our being gathered uh, to Jesus, going to be with Jesus. And in verse 2, he, he uses the Old Testament language to talk about this day. He talks about the day of the Lord, these three terms for what will happen at the end. But do you notice at the end of verse 2 what the false teaching is that they've received? Uh, it's not exactly clear from the verses how it's come, whether someone's posed as Paul and written a letter to them, or whether someone's been teaching and claiming Paul, Paul's backing on what they've been saying. But the assertion is, the end of verse 2, that the day of the Lord has already come. Um, and actually, uh, the NIV translation here um, it could actually be a little bit different to what's written here. Uh, the NIV says the day of the Lord has already come. Uh, the more recent studies on kind of the Greek verbs and that sort of thing, and actually a more natural translation of that verb at the end of the verse, suggests that it's actually the day of the Lord is in the process of coming. It's imminent. Uh, it's right here, right now. That's the kind of teaching uh, that the Thessalonians have been taken in by. I'm just going to have a drink of water and then we'll keep going. <coughs> Hold, won't shake. <laughs> Uh, but as you have a look at um, what Paul says there about this, the, this idea of the imminence of the day of the Lord, it, it's a little bit like you might think about um, when you're at the airport. Um, tomorrow I'm catching a plane down to Sydney for the annual FIEC conference. I'll feed back to you a bit about that next week, what's happening in our network of churches. But uh, my expectation is that I'm, as I'm waiting for that plane to, to board, uh, heading down to Sydney, that people will be keeping an ear out for the, the call that it's time to board that plane. But my expectation is that most people will still be getting on with life. Uh, there might be some people on their phones kind of having work conversations. There will be others typing off emails, some reading a book or drinking a coffee or going to the bathroom. But the thing is, once that call comes that now is the time to board the plane, normal life will stop, everyone will drop what they are doing, and they'll start lining up and boarding that plane. 
And what's happened with the Thessalonians is that they think that we're at the stage where the call has come. Jesus is returning right now. Drop everything else um, and, and get on board the plane. Or drop everything else. Jesus is coming back right now. And Paul wants to say to them, no, it's, we're not quite there yet. And in fact, the context in what we'll see in the rest of this chapter actually fits with that idea. Paul's not trying to tell them that the day of the Lord hasn't yet come. He wants them to know that there's a key event that will happen before Jesus actually returns. And it's interesting when you think about the Thessalonian believers. We saw last week, for those who are here, that they are facing this kind of stiff uh, persecution. They're, they're suffering. Um, and so you can imagine that this teaching was quite appealing for them to think that Jesus is coming back right now. They can just drop what they're doing uh, and wait for him to come. That was quite an appealing teaching for them. And in fact, Paul, next week, as we get into chapter 3, will have to address this uh, and talk about the fact that, no, they still need to work and do their job and earn the bread that they eat and all that sort of thing. We'll get into that next week. But it's interesting when you think about us, because uh, I think for many of us, I'm, I'm sure not all of us, um, but that's not so much our temptation. I mean, we, we talked about last week how um, things are getting tougher for Christians in Australia. But I think for many of us, life is still pretty good as a Christian in Australia. I think the false teaching that we're maybe more likely to be taken in is that teaching that the day of the Lord's never coming, that hell doesn't really exist, that there isn't actually a judgment day to come. But you see, whatever our misconception concerning the end that is to come, the solution that Paul has for us in this chapter is really the same solution for each and every one of us. He wants to tell us to hold fast to the gospel. Uh, that's the key point that he wants to make. Uh, as you probably noticed as we went through this reading, there's, there's a fair few details in this chapter. I'm not going to touch on all of them, so if there's things that I don't touch on, feel free to raise that in question time, but it will just take us a little bit to get through what the Apostle Paul has to say there. But just pick it up with me in verse 3. He says there, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. And really what Paul is saying here to the Thessalonians is that the key event that must happen before Jesus actually comes back is that this man of lawlessness must be revealed. He must appear. And if that hasn't happened, then you can be sure that Jesus isn't quite ready to return yet. Now that's what Paul is saying here. And as you look through the rest of the chapter, there's all sorts of things that Paul tells us about this man of lawlessness. I mean, verse 3, um, his appearing will be connected with a rebellion against God, uh, the implication would be. Uh, we're told that this man is doomed to destruction, verse 3, so he's not going to be victorious. In the end, he will be destroyed. Verse 4, we're told what he'll actually do. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Uh, and as you keep working through the passage, you're going to see other things that Paul has to say. Um, he's not just uh, going to set himself up in God's place, but verse 9, uh, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. Uh, Paul is saying here that the coming of the lawless one, it will be a work of Satan, the, the lawless one will do all these signs and miracles to lead people astray. That will be attached to this work of the lawless one. But really, key, uh, Paul's main point here is that this will be the key event that will signal that it's time for Jesus to return, time for Jesus to come back. That's why the Thessalonians shouldn't have been taken in by this teaching um, that Jesus was imminently about to return because the lawless one had not appeared. And I don't know about you, but as I kind of first read through this chapter, the question that came to my mind is, you know, where does Paul get this stuff from? Where has he come up with this idea about the lawless one? Uh, where has he got all these details from? Is this kind of a special revelation that has come to Paul? And, and it kind of pushes it a little bit further, because if you look in verse 5, um, Paul says to the Thessalonians, he says, don't you remember when I was with you, that I used to tell you these things. Uh, last week we heard that Paul was in Thessalonica three Sabbath days. He spent three Saturdays with the Thessalon Thessalonians. Somehow he's managed to pass on the gospel message, Jesus' life, death and resurrection, 
And does this mean that he's kind of spent all this time lecturing them on these detailed things that are going to happen at the end with the coming of the lawless one? Is that what Paul's saying here? Well, I think actually as you kind of look into this and press the details a little bit more, you get to see that what Paul's talking about, it's, it's not actually as novel as it seems. What Paul is really saying to them is a kind of direct connection and direct application of the gospel message itself. It's something that has a very firm and clear precedent in the rest of the scriptures and particularly, obviously, back into the Old Testament. Um, one example, uh, so the, the language of the man of lawlessness talked about in verse 3 there, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what was called the LXX, uh, you see Psalm, um, what is it, 89 verse 22, Isaiah 57, 3 and 4, use that kind of language of a son of lawlessness, a man of lawlessness. But even more than that is the fact that Paul is really alluding back to and, and really picking up on a lot of the prophecies uh, that were made in the Old Testament book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel wrote his book uh, sometime in the 6th century, most likely. Uh, it talks in the first half about what happened to him uh, during that period of the exile in Israel's history. But the second half of the book, Daniel gives us all sorts of detailed prophecies um, about what was to come in the future. Kind of fascinating prophecies on one level. And, and it's interesting as you look at Daniel's prophecies, because part of those prophecies were actually fulfilled not too long after Daniel lived. Uh, you get some of those key prophecies fulfilled even by the 2nd century BC before Jesus Christ has even stepped foot on earth. And so one particular instance that I'd uh, draw our attention to, I'm not going to read out the verses, but you can jot them down. Uh, Daniel chapter 8 verses 9 to 14 and Daniel 11, uh, chapter, uh, sorry, Daniel 11 verse 29 to 35. You get these verses that talk about this king uh, who would come and who would lead a rebellion. It's not dissimilar from what Paul is talking about. Uh, this king who would um, lead an army, he would uh, kind of rebel against God's people, he would put an end to the sacrifices that were happening in the temple, and he would set up this thing called, uh, or he would set up what Daniel calls the abomination that causes desolation, which is actually a phrase that's picked up numerous times through uh, the book of Daniel. And, and what you see is you look at those details in Daniel's prophecies and, and as people have looked at the history that folded out from those prophecies is that all of that was kind of fulfilled in the second century BC. There was a Syrian king, uh, his name was Antiochus IV. Um, he gave himself the, the title Epiphanes, uh, so Antiochus, Epiphanes, Epiphanes means God manifest. That was his title. He was God amongst them. Uh, and what um, Antiochus did was he led... Uh, the army into Jerusalem, he actually killed tens of thousands of the Israelites. Uh, he, he had put a stop to the sacrifices happening in the temple. And in 167 uh, BC, uh, he set up this uh, sacrifice to the Greek god Zeus right on the main altar that was for burnt sacrifices at the temple in Jerusalem. Kind of desecrated the temple. That was the... Um, abomination that causes desolation that Daniel was speaking about. And, and as you kind of, I mean, it's interesting as you think about this figure, Antiochus Epiphanes, because if you zoom back on the history, he's a bit of a nobody on one level. He, he didn't do that much else. He died very shortly after this. Two years later, he was dead. He died from a disease. Uh, he's a very minor figure in history. But of course, the reason that God gives this prophecy uh, to his people in the book of Daniel is because for them, I mean, this was like the end of the world. But God wouldn't even protect his temple from this happening. I mean, that was devastating. And so God gave them this prophecy through Daniel beforehand so that they would know even though there was this great disastrous thing that was going to happen, it would not be the end. It would only be for a time and then God would step in, which is in fact what he did. Uh, not too long after that, a few years later, they'd purified the temple and they were back into things. And as you look at the book of Daniel, there's some prophecies like that that were fulfilled very shortly after, but there's another group of prophecies that are really pointing off further into the future. As you get into the end of Daniel chapter 11, uh, there's this language about another king, a king who would be a little bit like Antiochus, but a king who would almost out Antiochus Antiochus. He would be even worse than Antiochus. Not only would he lead a rebellion and, and kill many people, not only would he put an end to sacrifices and set up this abomination that causes desolation, but he himself, in his very presence, would be an abomination. 
He would be a source of horror and contempt for all of God's people. This would be a drastic and terrible time that would come at the end of history. And as you kind of look at what Daniel speaks about with this king who was to come at the end, you can see kind of very clear parallels with what the Apostle Paul speaks about uh, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 with this man of lawlessness. If I can just uh, read one verse from Daniel chapter 11 verse 36. If you want to keep your eyes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 and just that language of this man of lawlessness who will oppose and will exalt himself and listen to what Daniel has to say uh, about this same figure. Daniel 11.36, he says, The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed, for what has been determined must take place. You see, what Daniel is speaking about is what Paul is picking up on uh, in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians. Uh, there was going to be this lawless one who would come at the very end of time. That would be the sign that the end is here. And in fact, Paul wasn't the only one who picked up on what Daniel had to say about this final distressing time. Actually, Jesus Christ spoke about it as well with his disciples. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, Matthew chapter 24, there's a little bit of his, uh, what he said recorded in Luke as well. But Jesus kind of picks up on things that Daniel has said and also um, kind of hints towards things that Paul will pick up later in 2 Thessalonians 2. If I can just read a few verses, I know this is a little bit detailed. Um, if you've lost me, that's okay. You can pick it up at question time. I, I hope the main point that I'm working towards will still be clear. But just hear some of the things that Jesus says in Mark chapter 13 and, and just the parallels between what we've looked at in both Daniel and 2 Thessalonians. Mark 13 verse 5, Jesus said to his disciples, watch out that no one deceives you. Now, that's kind of what Paul's saying to the Thessalonians. Mark chapter 13, verse 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. You see, Paul's saying there will be bad stuff going on. Uh, sorry, Jesus is saying there will be bad stuff going on, but the end is still to come because it will get really bad by the end. And that is what Paul is saying as well. Uh, just to see that, where Jesus goes with this idea, Mark chapter 13 uh, verse 14 and following, uh, he says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, uh, let the reader understand, and he's talking back about Daniel's prophecies. He says, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter. Because those days will be days of distress, unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short these days, then no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. You sort of see the connections between what Jesus says there, and uh, back to Daniel, I mean, he's talking about this abomination that causes desolation, and then forward to Paul, he's talking about this period which will be an unmatched period of distress for God's people in all of history. A terrible time. And he's saying to his disciples, if there's wars and things going on, don't, don't think the end is yet, because it will get worse before the end comes. And yet one thing that's interesting about what Jesus says, or maybe what he doesn't say, uh, he doesn't mention this figure, the, the lawless one. Uh, he doesn't speak about this king who would rise up in what he says to his disciples. And I think part of the reason for that is because in the first instance, Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for his death, which is just about to happen. I mean, back at the time of Daniel, uh, that prophecy was to prepare God's people for that terrible time that was coming under Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, you see, there was that warning that had come to God's people so that when this devastating time came for God's people, they would, they would not be unprepared for it. And in the same way as Jesus speaks to his disciples and applies Daniel's prophecies, he's trying to point out that he is about to die. God himself come down to, into this world as a man. He is going to be strung up on a cross. I mean, what could be a greater abomination than the very place where God dwelt on earth, Jesus Christ himself, being put to death? And of course, in the same way as uh, 
Just as quickly as Antiochus rose, he was swept away. Well, so with Jesus, just as quickly as he died and was buried, he rose again and God showed himself victorious. And of course, that very gospel message actually teaches us, I mean, I think what Jesus was talking about also has application to the very end of time, that most distressing of seasons for God's people when the lawless one will raise up that Paul has spoken about. And then, of course, when God will be vindicated, Jesus will return. I mean, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, it says that Jesus will appear and by the breath of his mouth, by the glory of his appearing, the lawless one will be shoved out of the way. It will be no contest, no battle, but it will be a distressing time. It will be a terrible time for God's people. And I think really what Paul is trying to get through to the Thessalonians is that if they had have just understood this gospel message, this message about the fact that God uh, always works. He is at work when the most distressing times are happening and it is in those moments that God is stepping in to bring vindication. If, that is, if they knew that that was how God did things, then they would have been prepared for the fact that yes, things are hard for them in the here and now, but they are only going to get worse right before the end, before Jesus died. If they held fast to the gospel, they wouldn't have been deceived by this message that has come to them. Uh, about Jesus returning in the here and now, right now. And as you kind of uh, think about that idea, I mean, it's a, it's a bad analogy, but uh, think about it like this. Um, at my house, um, there's lots of coming and going. So the car will drive up, one kid gets dropped off, another kid gets picked up, the car drives out again. Lots of coming and going. We're in that sort of almost in the teenage years with our kids. Um, but the other day, it was a little while back, but I'd come home, I'd uh, had the boys with me, we kind of walked in the front door, I dropped the keys inside, and then we went out to the backyard and did some work. Um, Amber was inside, but she'd planned to uh, walk down the street and, and meet with um, her mum, uh, who was actually here at the hall with Jay. Um, and so she locked up the house, walked out down the street. Uh, by the time the boys and I came back to the front door, we're, we're locked out, no key. Um, I'm sure you've had that experience where you're locked out of your car, locked out of your house. It's... It's kind of confusing. What, what, do you, what do you do in that moment? Do you kind of try and break in? Do you call the person who's got the key and tell them to come and drop what they're doing? What, what do you do? It's a confusing moment. You really need the key. I said it was a bad example, bad illustration. Uh, when it comes to the, the, the teachings that surround us about the end of times, it, it can be confusing. It can be distracting. It can be hard to know what the way forward is. Paul is saying to us that the key is to know the gospel. If we know the gospel of Jesus Christ, God himself being strung up on the cross, this worst of worst of moments happening, and then only after that Jesus being risen to new life, then we would know that when it comes to the end, it will be the most distressing of times as this lawless one comes, as this great rebellion happens, and just as quickly as it appears, Jesus will come back, he will step in, and all things will be wrapped up. And as you kind of hear me explain this passage like that, I'm sure there's some here who are feeling like that's just too simplistic. Paul's got all these details about what's going on and what's going to happen at the end of the world. And I'm saying just, he's just telling us to hold on to the gospel. Well, I want to show you that I think that what is what Paul is saying to us. Um, I mean, he said, don't you remember what I told you? He didn't have that long with them. He just passed the gospel message on to them. He expects them to have got this. And just have a look at how he closes out the chapter, verse 13 of chapter 2. He says to the Thessalonians, But we ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as firstfruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. He called you to this through our gospel, that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings that we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth, or by letter. And what Paul is saying here, he's telling the Thessalonians they've been chosen, God has saved them. Uh, see in verse 13 there, he's saved them through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. God has kind of brought this um, illumination and light um, to the eyes of those who have been saved in Thessalonica. And the other way that that has happened, says Paul, is through belief in the truth. They have heard this message from Paul, and as they have believed that message, they have been saved. And Paul kind of stresses this second part in verse 14, he has called you to this, to being saved through the gospel. That is how they have come into sharing the glory of Jesus Christ. It's through the gospel. And so Paul's application for them, verse 15, is uh, 
to hold fast. Verse 15, hold fast to the teachings, hold fast to the traditions that Paul has passed on to them. And it's interesting as you look at this verse 15, because there's that phrase at the end, these teachings passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. We've heard that phrase already in the chapter. Uh, Back in verse 2, the Thessalonians had had this um, teaching, a wrong teaching, a deceitful teaching, supposedly in Paul's name, by word of mouth or by letter. And then in verse 15, we hear that same phrase. And so it's almost like you've got one message that they've received by word of mouth and by letter that's a deceptive message, and another one, supposedly, I mean, for all they know, it's from the same person, another tradition and teaching that's been passed on to them by word of mouth and letter, and that's the thing that will keep them from being deceived by this other message. I mean, what else could that tradition or teaching be apart from the gospel that Paul has just mentioned in verse 14? That is the thing that he wants these Thessalonians believers to hold firmly on to. If they hold fast to that, they will not be deceived. They will be ready for the end when it comes, that moment when things will get worse, just as they did at Jesus' death on the cross, and when Jesus then comes back in great power, just like he did in his resurrection. And so if that's the case, if that's the way that we keep from deception is to hold fast to the gospel, uh, what are we to do about that? It's not that tricky, is it? We, we, we hold fast to the gospel. We try and know the gospel and we try and hold fast to it. And I would say to you, if you're here this afternoon and maybe you, you don't yet know Jesus, maybe you don't know a whole lot about this gospel message so that you can hold fast to it and be prepared for the end, I want to encourage you to actually look into that and get that information to get the content of this gospel that Paul has been preaching. Um, One way you can do that here at Make, we offer a course called um, Christianity Explored. I think I've got a slide with with that title on the screen, but it's a six-week course. It works through Mark's Gospel that we've had a few readings from this afternoon. It's a biography of Jesus. There's a short video section. You read a bit of Mark's Gospel, a few questions, a chance to ask any questions that you might have. You work through the key ideas of this gospel message in six weeks. If, If you're someone who would like to look into these things please do chat to me. I'd love to set you up with someone to run through that course. And I would say to you as well, if you're a Christian here and you've got a friend uh, who you think might be interested to know more about this Christian message, this Christian gospel, um, and you'd like some help with that, please do chat to me. I'd love to give you the resources, get you set up uh, so that that can happen for your friend uh, to work through that course and and hear the gospel. But for those who are Christians here this afternoon, I, I want us to kind of ponder Uh, how crazy it is that this chapter that Paul has given us, which as we've seen is really trying to stress to us the fact that we need to hold fast to the gospel message, the message about Jesus Christ. We need to search the scriptures and understand the gospel from the scriptures as they are presented through Daniel and, and through Mark and through Paul. That's what we're to do. How crazy is it that this could be a chapter that people would twist and distort and use to make up all sorts of other messages that are proposed to be what is going to happen before the end of time. Friends, we need to make sure we are holding fast to the gospel so that we are not the ones who get deceived. And I would encourage you to pursue that. Uh, How do you do that? I mean, keep coming along to our Sunday services as we work through books of the Bible, as we read the Bible, as we have opportunities for question time. We'll open it up for questions in a few moments to kind of wrestle these things through together. We need to keep getting to know the gospel from the Scriptures. Get along to Bible study group, a great place uh, to throw these ideas around with other people and to think through the scriptures together. You might think to yourself, well, I've been around a while, I know the gospel, I'm okay. I mean, Paul's not talking about just kind of ticking a box and knowing the gospel. No, he's using the language of hold fast to this. He's saying to them, have you you already forgotten what I told you when I was there? He expects them to to have been thinking and mulling on those things that he told them, those three weeks that he was with them, hold fast to the gospel, says Paul. We can never have enough of this. We need to keep digging into the scriptures, going deeper and deeper and trying to know it more fully. Another thing you could do, I mean, read through the Bible yourself so that you can test what you're being taught, so that you're going deeper in the the gospel yourself. I've sometimes hand out a Bible reading plan here at Make. You'll see uh, that I've got one of those in your bulletin this afternoon. Um, Really, it's just a way that you can track your progress through the Bible. Don't worry too much about the dates on that sheet of paper, but it's a great way to mark off uh, what books of the Bible you have read and haven't read um, as you read through the Bible. If you got through that whole thing, you'd have read the full Bible. 
uh, and the New Testament twice, the Psalms twice. I encourage you to do that. And the final thing I'd urge you to in terms of holding fast to the gospel, if, if you are kind of struggling to get your head around some of the things that the Bible is saying to you, um, something that can be helpful is a study Bible. There is a lot of content in the Bible. Um, understand that. Um, and so a study Bible can be very helpful. I've got a couple of those listed in your bulletin. There's the ESV study Bible, which has helpful notes on the text in it. I haven't actually read that much myself, but I've heard it's very good. Uh, and also one that I have been reading is the NIV um, Zondervan Study Bible, uh, which has D.A. Carson as the editor. Uh, it's got excellent introductions to each book of the Bible, great notes on the verses as you go through the books of the Bible. If, that's, if you're wanting to go deeper with things, you're wanting some guides with it, uh, that would be a great resource for you to chase down. But we began this afternoon asking that question, how uh, will we know what will happen at the end? How do we keep from getting thrown around by all the speculation that surrounds us about the future? Uh, we've seen that we do it by holding fast to the gospel. That's what will keep us from being deceived, knowing that the way God works uh, is that things get worse and then they get better. Uh, Satan has his last big crack. And you imagine as we get close to the end of the world, I mean, Satan is going to go very hard and then Jesus will come back and it will all be done. We hold fast to that gospel message. We know God and the way that he works. We need to keep going deeper and deeper into understanding that gospel. And I just think really what we're being called to is to have this message of the gospel as our story. The death of Jesus, crisis and then salvation. That's how God works. That needs to become part of us and who we are. We need that story deeply knitted within us. And I just want to close out. Um, it's kind of related. It's a good quote. Um, C.H. Spurgeon, who was a, a preacher in the 19th century, a Baptist preacher, um, it's, it's a bit of an extended quote, but he encourages us to kind of take the word of God into our hearts and souls. I just want to read that to close up before we um, pray and then open up for questions. So Spurgeon says, he says, Oh, that you and I might get into the very heart of the word of God and get that word into ourselves. As I have seen the silkworm eat into the leaf and consume it, so ought we do with the word of the Lord, not just crawl over its surface, but eat right into it till we have taken it into our innermost parts. It is idle merely to glance over the words or to recollect the poetical expressions or the historic facts, but it is blessed to eat into the very soul of the Bible until at last you come to talk in scriptural language and your very style is fashioned upon scriptural models and what is better, your spirit is flavoured with the words of the Lord. He goes on, I know this is long, but it's good. Um, he, he goes on and says, I would quote John Bunyan, he's a Puritan from the 17th century, as an instance of what I mean. Read anything of his and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had read the Bible till his very soul was saturated with scripture and through his writings, are char though his writings are charmingly full of poetry, yet he cannot give us his pilgrim's progress, that sweetest of all prose poems, without continually making us feel why this man is a living Bible. Prick him anywhere and his blood is bibline. The very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text for his very soul is full of the word of God. I would commend, commend his example to you, beloved. Uh, so that's a, a call and something to aspire to, to have bibline blood. Uh, but let's pray that God would help us to hold fast to this message about Jesus. Let's pray. Loving Father, we do just thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you have prepared us for what is to come. Um, Father, we know that they are going to be distressing days at the end. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to keep the gospel message firmly before us, that we would know how Satan works, that we would know how you work, uh, that you will allow Satan that final crack at your people before Jesus Christ returns at the end and help us to have confidence in you. Lord, help us to hold fast to this gospel message which will keep us from being deceived. And we just pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen.